So, during uh, the uh, break, between first service and this service, uh, I discovered something. And if any of you think you have gotten to the place where you can't discover anything more, then you, you, have, you have found all there is to find that you've gotten to that age where you've got it down pat and nothing else can surprise you, let me just say, <laughs> you're living in a fool's paradise. Um, <laughs> that's my theology on that, okay? Because I, I discovered something, and it's oat milk. <laughs> I did not know that there was such a thing as oat milk. And I was given oat milk to taste, and I tasted it. And it's, it's that stuff that is left over in the Cheerios after you eat all the Cheerios. <laughs> oat milk. People have figured a way to sell the stuff that's left in the bowl after you eat the Cheerios. It's like blackened chicken. Somebody in New Orleans figured a way to get Yankees to eat burned chicken. <laughs> and they came up with, the, it's blackened, it's burnt, okay? I mean, I, I grew up with women that knew how to make chicken. You know, I, I, I grew up with women that knew how to make collard greens, you know what I'm saying? and knew what a black-eyed pea was and what harmony was for. I mean, I, I, I grew up with grits, okay? And I know burned chicken when I see it. It's burned chicken. They said, let's give it a real cool name and Yankees will eat this. They were, Human, Americans will do anything if you wrap it up right, you know? If you get the right labeling and you wrap it up right and call it some cute thing, pet rocks. You guys probably don't remember. Pet rocks. Pet rocks. Somebody got a box and put pet and, and, and they put a rock in there and they sold it to people. Pet, it was pet rocks, man. It's like they're still giving out, they're still selling chia pets, chia pets, you know? It's a piece of pottery with, with, with green hair growing out of it, and people buy that and give it to each other for gifts. Don't ever give me something with green hair. I've seen those before when I used to do acid. I don't want to see. You know, there's some things in life you want to move on from. And dudes with green hair is one of those things. My son got married and he went down to Savannah over uh, the St. Patrick's Day holiday. And if you don't know about this, Savannah, Georgia has a, a great, great population of Irish people. And along the river is where they uh, hang. And my son went down there with his new bride and decided it was a good idea to get his hair dyed green. And I'm talking about jelly bean green here. I'm not talking about olive drab or anything, or, uh, you know, Marine Corps green, or Army green, you know, or, or Kelly green. I'm talking about jelly bean green. I mean, shine in the dark green hair, okay? And he's, he's six four and covered with tattoos, and he has green hair. This is my son, I'm so proud. <laughs> and he and his brother, who's 6'6", were working at the same restaurant in, in Lexington, Kentucky when we lived down there. And my son, uh, Jesse, was, it, he was uh, serving drinks. He was working at a Red Lobster, and he was serving drinks to some people, and there was a guy there who was about three sheets to the wind. Well, he's about two and a half sheets to the wind, you know. He, he wasn't talking weird yet, you know. He, uh, so Jesse came out there with his drink, and he put it down, and, and the guy said, this is, this is going to be this is going to be my last one. My last, this is my last one. And Jesse said, well, that's probably a good idea, but uh, why are you saying that? He says, oh, he says, I, uh, he says, I saw a guy that looks just like you go in the kitchen and had green hair. <laughs> oh. 
oat milk, folks. Here's the question. How, how, how do you milk an oat? You got to have a little tiny stool to milk an oat. And I can understand milking almonds because they're like, but this is an oat. How do you, I don't, uh, it's like people, people have worm ranches. Did you know that? It's actually a thing. People, they, they, have, they have worm ranches and they raise worms for fish bait. Worm, worm wrenches. How do, you, how do you tell somebody with a straight face that you're a worm wrencher, that you're a, you're a, you're a, you're a, a worm wrangler, that you're a, not a cowboy, you're a worm boy? How do you do that? How do you herd worms? I just, you know, this is a little tiny pony. Yeah. You know, I mean, worms, man. Learn something new every day. And I just, there's a lot of things that I'm glad that I learned after I got straight. Because if I had learned them while I was still loaded all the time, I would still be standing somewhere going. <laughs> How many of you have ever been in the airport in Chicago? You ever been and you know that, that tunnel that goes between uh, uh, the A gates and the, and the C gates? It goes underneath the runway and it's got all of those lights in it that they're all on a sequence? <laughs> no, man, no. Uh-uh. No, sir, I'll walk across the runway with planes on it before I'll go in there. Because I tell you, there was a time I would have just gotten off that running walkway and, put, and got on and went back the other way. Got on, and, went, and I mean, I would still be going round and round going, whoa, dude, you know. <laughs> you know. People, people on dope are so funny anyway. Well, they used to be back in the day. I, it's been so long. I told some, you know, we were doing uh, a thing with recovery the other night at our church, and the kids were getting up and going, I'm seven years clean. And I'm going, wow, that's so cool, you know. I'm so-and-so. And somebody said, how about you, Papa Mike? I said, I'm 62 years clean. They went, whoa. <laughs> I said, don't get excited. It just means that you can make it too. If I can make it, you can make it, you know. It's, I, you know. So one of, the, one of the best testimonies I ever heard was one of Jesus' people were about telling these gigantic testimony stories because it was all about our testimony, you know. And, and we would you would get into this gig where we were trying to overcome, overdo each other with our testimonies, you know. Well, I rode my Harley down the, right down the middle of the mall. To, you know, it's bad. Well, it's nothing. I rode my Harley to the grocery store. And I rode my Harley through grocery store and hit a lady with a cantaloupe. Well, it's nothing. I, you know, and you do that. So we were doing this in Bakersfield, uh, California one night in this little Pentecostal church. And I remember it was hotter than 500 and we had all the windows open and there were, the church was full of people. And then there were people standing outside, hanging in the windows, watching all us freaks do our thing. (laughs) And, uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and this lady gets up, and she's got, she's a Pentecostal lady, all right? So she's got white hair, and it's stacked up pretty good. You know, she's got one of those hairdos where, you know, they get excited, and they throw their hair down. You ever, ever heard that expression? She, shake, she shook her hair down? That's a Pentecostal thing. Get all this hair up here, and you get blessed. You start doing like that, and that hair starts, and those bobby pins start flying around. Man, it's like, you know, bouncing off the walls and stuff. And you got a lady that's running the aisles and got hair down to her ankles. That is a Pentecostal lady that is blessed of God. Thank you very much. That's one lady in Arkansas. She said, uh, I got the devil by the tail on a downhill run, shouting, ki yippee yippee yay you know. So. <laughs> oh, so we're telling our testimonies, and all of a sudden, this little lady gets up, and she's got the most beautiful white, you know, some people have the most beautiful white hair, and I look at them, and guess how my, my hair was like that, it just, it almost shines, you know, it's like almost a, the aura of God, you know, and and she had that hair, and it's a little bitty, diminutive thing, and she was wearing a little puff sleeve uh, blouse and a little long skirt, you know. It was 
like a patchwork quilt, you know, and she's just standing there and she goes, my name is Mother Baker and I want you all to know that I just love you and I'm just so excited to be here and hear what Jesus has done in all your lives. And I'd like to tell you, I'm 85 years old and I accepted Jesus when I was four years old and he has gotten better every day since then. And when I first saw her stand up and all these testimonies of all these guys that got their nose over here and, you know, and chains hanging out of their face and stuff, and I thought, what's she? She killed her husband. He's in the trunk. What? You know, <laughs> how is she going to outdo anybody? And she gets up and she does that. And all of a sudden it dawned on me. Saving grace is a wonderful thing. Keeping grace is even better. So what? Does it mean to get saved if God isn't able to keep you? And she's 85 years old and has followed the Lord, walked the Lord, raised a family, raised her grandkids and her great grandkids all these years, all these years, and still loves the Lord just like she did when she was four years old. Still praising the Lord, still raising her hands, still dancing before the altar, you know. We do that, you know. Pentecostals like to, we like to dance and that's why Baptists don't like us much, because uh, <laughs> Baptists, they only dance when you make them walk over coals. Uh, that was just a joke. It just came to my mind, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting older. The stuff that comes to my mind now is not quite as funny as it used to be. It is to me, but then again, <laughs> a lot of these old jokes I'm just hearing again for the first time. <laughs> yeah. Different life. Anyway, I wanted to tell you uh, something, a couple of other things. Uh, oatmeal, can you believe that? Mm. Anyhow... Um, I love you guys. You are so beautiful. Do you know the term namaste? Have you heard that? Namaste. You know what that means? It's Sanskrit. It means I see the spirit of God in you. That's all it means. People get themselves all in a knot over it, but that's all it means. I see the spirit of God in you. Well, how could you say that to some Muslim person or some Hindu person? Now, you can see the Spirit of God in them. Yes, I do. When you were born, the Lord breathed his breath into you. The first thing you did when you were born was take a big breath, and then you cried your brains out. You know, wow! Because it's no good taking a breath in if you've got no place to let it out just so you know. <laughs> Last thing you do when you pass from this world is you go, <sighs> and you give that breath back to the Lord. And in that breath, there is a spark it's called destiny. And everybody has one, everybody. Amen. Every human being has a spark. Every human being has a destiny. Every human being is given a measure of grace. Everybody, everybody. Say that with me. Everybody. Not some people. Not just the people that are my color or my denomination or my political party. Everybody. Babies. Mama Susan thinks that you need a guy. Yeah, Mama Susan's my wife. Of course, me. Yeah, and I'm Papa Mike, and she's Mama Susan, so we're the real mamas and papas. <laughs> We've been California dreaming for a long time. <laughs> John and Mitchie are getting kind of itchy just to leave the folk. Yeah, never mind. Uh, some of the young people are going, what in the world is that? The rest of you are going, yeah. Uh. But I bet you if I, if I sang Yellow Submarine, all of you would know the words to that, you know. Oh, 
I'm not going to do it. I was just saying. <laughs> but anyway, Susan, she has this vision of, of, of little, little angels. Little, you know how you've ever, have you ever seen a little, it's just a little face, just a little angel face with little wings, and, you know, called seraphim. And um, she thinks that all, she, this is not theological and you don't need to write this in the fly page of your Bible, but her vision of babies coming to earth is these little guys are all around the throne. It's like the Lord sits in the middle of all these little angel fireflies and they're just sparkling all around his throne. And the Lord says, hmm, well, this couple here, they need a baby. And the little, the little angels are going, send me, send me, send me, send me, send me, send me. I want to do your will. I want to take your love to the world. Send me, send me. And the Lord says, okay, go, you know. And then they get here. And they're beautiful. You can show them that picture. I think we got it. This is how, this is how the babies look. You got that picture for me, Joel? Uh, That is Amelia Claire. That's my first great-granddaughter. I have five more behind her. And she is just about as cute as it gets. And they come. They come into the... Everybody comes in like that. Everybody has, has that moment right there. They may not have the pink glasses or the sparkles around them, but every single child starts out like that. How in the world do they wind up sitting on a street corner, tweaked out of their brains, with dope sores all over their faces, trying to do the best they can to get the next meal or the next buck to, to, to be able to spend on their addiction to get the next hit? How, do, how does that happen? I, it's, it's, it's easy. It's one word. The world. <clears throat> The world does it to them. This is a very, this is a very fallen place, this world we live in. And to expect it to be anything else is naive. Because this world is the result of our forefathers' original sin. Sin, when Adam and Eve came into being, there was no sin. <clears throat> We were supposed to stay like that. No, not little like that and babies like that, but that innocence. We were supposed to have that innocence. And we were supposed to remain those beautiful little creatures. But the world and sin took that away from us. The only way that we're able to do that now is by repenting of our sin, rejecting the world, and walking with the Jesus who loves us, who is the creator who made us beautiful in the first place. Amen. You, you understand? I look out this morning and I think, gosh, what a beautiful sight. What beautiful faces. And what, a, what a beautiful gentleman right here. And what a beautiful lady right over there. And brother behind me there, he was, we're talking about the, 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 how hard it is to get old, but of course, you know, the alternative kind of sucks, but, uh, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to say that anymore. It vacuums. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, but he's got the greatest smile. He's, just a, he's a really, really handsome gentleman, and there's a beautiful lady right over there, and there, all of you, you're just so gorgeous. You know why? Because God gave us this spark, and when we give ourselves to him, he reunites it, and he re-energizes uh, that thing that the world has tried to beat out of us. And we go back to our natural, our natural selves. Our natural state is to be those lovely little beings that God created out of his heavenly flower, fireflies. We are, and he's given us a word to read. He's given us a, a, a destiny to fulfill, and he's given us a place to come and do that called the church. And there is a day that is set aside for him. And I'll tell you, a church full of people who know the Lord sitting in the house of God on the Sabbath is probably the best and most beautiful picture you're ever going to see. 
You people are gorgeous. You, you just don't realize it, but you are. All of you are. Because you have the beauty of God in you, you know? It's never going to be about your shell because this is corruptible. I mean, once the blood stops flowing, this thing's going to turn to dirt. It's what is eternal that keeps on going, you know? And it's that spark that God gives us that keeps on going and keeps us beautiful. Even after this life, when we're all together in the next life, standing and praising the Lord in the beauty and glory of God's, God's heaven and his kingdom. I wanted to share a story about this world and the things that it's capable of. It's a, it's a kind of a rugged story, but I, I think you guys, you'll get what I'm talking about. I uh, want to share some scripture with you if I could find it. I'm... I'm I'm not exactly really good at uh, technology. I can turn this on, and uh, <clears throat> I can pretty much find what I'm looking for, but it takes me a minute. But that's okay. At my age, everything takes me a minute. And uh, I, used to, I walked up here, and what's the first thing my, my good friend says to me? <laughs> Boy, it took you longer than it used to. I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> thank you, Pat. I, I appreciate the... Uh, I, I, I appreciate uh, that uh, very, very, very much. Not, uh, not so much. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> just kidding, just kidding. I, I realize, you know, I'm, I'm really at peace with growing older, you know, because if, if the Lord had wanted me out of here, he could have done it at any time. Actually, if he'd been really, really kind to me, he would have done it. A lot earlier. I mean, he would have given me, I, when the night that I got saved, he would have just shot me right out of here. Thank you, Jerry. I accept you as personal Savior and Lord. Out of here. I wouldn't have had time to backslide. I wouldn't have had time to make mistakes. But then again, I wouldn't have had time to preach the gospel. I wouldn't have had the time to see people healed. I wouldn't have had the time to see people saved. I wouldn't have, so, you know, I, I'm at peace at growing, growing older because I know that I'm going to be here until the Lord's finished with me. And I've tried my best all my life to be obedient to the purpose of God because I believe that's my spark and I believe that's destiny, my destiny, and it's the one I got when he breathed into my nose and gave me the breath of life. That's what I think. But then again, there are other people with other definitions of why I'm still here. Like, I'm too mean to go to heaven. <laughs> I don't think I'm that mean. I'm truthful. You know, it's funny. When you're truthful, people think you're mean. <laughs> if you lie, they think you're understanding. Isn't that weird? Uh, yeah. If you, mean, if, you, if you tell the truth, you're narrow-minded, you know? And if you lie, you're a Democrat. I mean... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. But you do know lions of sin. You know where liars go? <laughs> Washington. I've got to stop now. Because I'm a man of a certain age, and so I have a right to have opinions about all sorts of political things, and I have them, and <laughs> you don't want to hear them. I swear you don't. You know, me and my older friends start talking politics and all of our kids, their eyes just start going like that, you know. Well, I'll tell you, when I was young, when we were young, we you know, would never blah, 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 you know. Well, praise God. Sometimes I think it'll be really, really good when I lose my memory completely because then I won't remember the, bad old, the good old days and then I won't miss them so bad, you know what I mean? I'll just look at what's going on and go, well, okay, you know, just... Share you a little verse of scripture. I, where's the clock at? Okay, I still got I still got time. All right. So, this is a verse of scripture from uh, from Psalms one thirty nine. 
And the key scripture is verse 7. I'm going to read to you about five verses. But the key verse is, is, is verse 7. It says this. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me by night, and you, and you will destroy the darkness of my soul because you are, because, I'm sorry, I, I, I skipped ahead. <laughs> it's all right, though. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is brighter as, the, as, bright as the day. For darkness is light with you. This is David talking to the Lord. Where will I go that you can't find me? Where will I go that you won't look for me? And if you look for me, you're going to find me. Where would I go where I, I, your presence is not there? If I would just admit it, if I would just see it, if I would just receive it, where, would, where could I go that uh, your presence wouldn't be there? Lately, I received a message uh, on Facebook for some friends. Um, the original message was written in Turkish. And um, Turkey is very an interesting place to me because in the, in the days of the Roman Empire, Turkey, what we call Turkey today, was known as Cappadocia. And it was a Roman province, and it was right up against the Roman province of Syria, where Damascus and Antioch were. Well, that is the birthplace of our Christian faith. When Jerusalem was being destroyed by the Romans... The people that, that were there who were Christians, they, they escaped and they went to Cappadocia. That's where they went and they built churches there. John, uh, the apostle, took Jesus' mother Mary and went and started a church in the city of Ephesus. And Mary lived there with John and Mary Magdalene in that church until she went to heaven, and, you know. John was in his 90s. He's the only one of the apostles that didn't get, um, he didn't get martyred. They tried to boil him once. He wouldn't boil. They tried to burn him. He wouldn't burn. They tried to cut his head off and all just break the sword. So they figured, just leave the old man alone because he's got something going on here, right? <laughs> and he got so old and infirmed that they'd have to carry him in on a litter on Sundays for the service. They carried him in on this litter and they'd sing a song that he when he came in they'd kind of prop him up against the, the platform you know he's in his late 90s and they'd say tell us the most important thing father john you walked with jesus you you sat with him at the last supper you put your head against his chest you were the one that he loved tell us tell us what's important and he'd look at him and the only words left for him to speak and the only left only words left for him to preach were, love one another, children. Love one another. And that was the most important thing to him. So Turkey is the, one of the seedbeds. Cappadocia is one of the seedbeds of our Christian faith. And around the year 300, there was a council in a place called Nicaea. And the Cappadocian fathers came there and sat down. And they decided what Orthodox Christianity was supposed to look like. These are the things that we believe. These are the things that are are acceptable for people who call themselves Christians and these other things over here are not. And even back then, there were people who were preaching things that were totally wrong. I mean, there was one group of people called Arians and they followed a guy named Arius and he decided that Jesus wasn't totally human, that he just looked human. Well, Jesus had to be human for his sacrifice to mean anything. And he had to be God in order for that to have any kind of eternal significance. So he had got to be totally man and totally God. And anybody that says different, that's something we can't accept as Christians. Amen. 
And I can accept how Methodists run their service. I can accept how Catholics, uh, Catholic priests dress in order to show people that they are servants of God. I can understand why Pentecostals do some of the stuff we do, but we cannot say that Jesus is not fully God and fully man and call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves something else, but not Christians, see? And they decided that 1,700 years ago. And the most of the guys that did that were all from Turkey, Cappadocia. So now they've had this gigantic earthquake there. Over 80,000 buildings have collapsed. 41,000 dead and, and rising and 89,000 people injured, and lots of them not expected to survive. They've said just recently that they are not looking for survivors anymore. They're just trying to recover the dead. And they found a little boy. He's five years old. This is being reported by Al Jazeera, the, uh, the uh, Islamic World News Organization. They found him. They got him out of the hole that he was in. He was under the rubble for 120 days. I'm sorry, 120 hours. That's, that's much better. A whole season, no, nah, no, nah, nah. It's 120 hours under the rebel. They got him out of there, and they looked at him and said, are you hungry? And five years old, he looked at him and said, well, there was this person in white who came to me from time to time and fed me and gave me water. So I'm all right. And the person, <laughs> person writing the story ended by saying, thanks be to God yeah. on El Jazeera. So friends of mine are uh, in a striker brigade, brigade in the Marine Corps, and years ago they were in Fallujah, and they were roaring down the street, and they went past a mosque, and out in front of the mosque was this sign. It said, healing service Fridays after prayer. So they pulled in to see what was going on. They went in, they found the imam, and they said, imam, you got a healing prayer service after regular prayers on Friday? He went, yes. They said, well, who, 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 are, you, who are you praying to? And he said, oh, Jesus, Jesus. We pray to Jesus for healing. Well, how did that come about, Imam? Well, my wife was really, really sick, and I did everything I was supposed to do as a good Muslim, and she didn't get well. And one night I had this dream, and Jesus said, if you'll ask me, to heal her, I'll heal her, and I did, and he did, and so we have healing services here at the mosque. And I said, but you still have Islamic services? He says, yeah. He says, I don't want to get my head cut off. <laughs> so I'm saved. I'm not stupid, you know. <laughs> so friends of mine went to, uh, to, uh, went to Kathmandu. Of course, as a hippie, you, all of us wanted to get to Kathmandu. We did it in different ways. Somebody went, some of us went to Kathmandu, and some of us flew to Kathmandu. <laughs> I'm going to Kathmandu. No, sorry. I mean, anyway, had a moment. Um, so they went up in the mountains above Kathmandu because they were going up there to 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 uh, to do services with some of the Buddhists up in the mountains there, really, really, really strict and very ethereal kind of folk. And they went up there and they found this temple. There wasn't a whole lot around it. It was just kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, all the people in there, all the Buddhists, including the, the Buddhist priests, they were all born again. They're all Christians. They were having church there in the Buddhist temple. 
There wasn't a, a, an unsaved person within 100 miles of that temple anywhere in those mountains. You know why? Same thing that happened to the imam happened to the Buddhist priest. His wife was sick and he prayed to Jesus and Jesus came and healed her. And because of that, he started preaching Jesus heals. Amen. Everybody got saved. I mean, they wouldn't say it the way we say it. They didn't have any theology or doctrines or anything like that. They just knew that he loved them and that he healed them. And they changed a hundred mile radius around the middle of this temple with this Buddhist priest in his orange robes and bald head saying, praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Where can I go that I can get away from you? Where will I ever be that your presence is not a thing that can be tangible to me? Where can I ever go? Where and in what pile of rubble can I be buried so deep that you can't come to me with food and water? Where can I go that you will not give me the food of everlasting life? And where can I go that you will not give me the water that gives me the ability to never thirst again? I cannot be anywhere so far away that you will forget me, that you will forget the, the spark that lives in me, that you won't be there in me and present with me and I care about you, and I love you, and no matter what the world has done to you, no matter what the world has tried to take from you, I remember you, little firefly. I remember you. I remember when you first came. I remember before the sin got you, and the abuse got you, and the dis disappointment got you, and the drugs got you. I remember you the way you really are, you beautiful thing. You gorgeous little little angel, I remember you. But beloved, it doesn't do any good for somebody to come to you with food and drink if you refuse to take it. There's no sense in having a Savior if you refuse to acknowledge Him. Do you understand? And you hang on to the world and you cling to the world and you reject the one that wants to save you. It's like eating a little bit of arsenic every day. And somebody comes and says, you know, I've looked at the reports and if you eat arsenic every day, it'll kill you. And you look at him and say, well, I know what the reports say, but this is what I think. And we come to you and say, Jesus loves you. The Bible says that he does. The Bible says he'll never leave you or forsake you. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And you say, well, I know what the Bible says, but this is what I think. The world has taught me this and the world has taught me that. The world has taken me from being a little spark of light and turned me into this mess under the collapsed life that I've built for myself out of the rubble that the world gave me to construct with. That's why all the buildings have fallen is because the contractors that built all those buildings were building with substandard material. The government in Turkey is now looking into these people that built all of these places that fell down with a shake. That's the world. It's what the world builds with. Substandard material gives you fake stuff instead of the real stuff. Changes you into something you were never supposed to be. Desecrates the destiny that God gave you and defaces the, the beauty that God gave you when you came into this world as an innocent little beautiful thing that was so excited to do God's will. You want to change that? He's here today. Man in white is walking these aisles. He's got bread and he's got water. 
And he's willing to, he's willing to pull you out of the rubble and give you a testimony, restore your life, restore, restore your light, and make you live and walk as beautiful as he knows you are. He's willing to do that if you're willing to say yes today. Everybody bow your heads with me. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, the Bible says, like I said just a minute ago, the Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. says everybody has sinned and come short of the glory of God but the Lord has said that if we ask for forgiveness he'd forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness pull us out of the rubble pull us out of the miry clay pull us out of the world and if you're trapped and you're smothering to death and you need rescue this morning the Lord's here to do that. If you're here and you've been rescued, but some of us, we walk a path that leads us to holes and we have a tendency to trip and fall from time to time. We need a re-rescue. We need the Lord to, we need to be sure that he's still with us. I'm here to testify that he is. So you pray this morning. Tell the Lord where you're at and what rubble you're under, and I'm sure that he'll be glad to lift you out of that mess. And if you're here and you're all right today, you're a good Christian, everything's going good, I want you to pray the prayer too because there's nothing better and more important than those of you who are good to be able to stand with those who are not so good. So let's just everybody pray. If you're here and you're praying for the first time, reach out and take what's offered. If you're here and you need to have a, re have a, have a fresh touch, reach out and take that. And if you're here today and you're giving your strength to somebody near you, be bold and do that. But let's just pray. Let's pray out loud, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've failed you in a lot of ways. Somewhere along the way, my little image got tarnished and my destiny got forgotten. But I'm thankful, Lord, that you never forgot. And I'm thankful that the scriptures say, fear not, I have overcome the world. So I reach out to you today. I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to be my personal savior. I ask you to make me new. Make me whole. And show me how to love the way you love. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Give him a big hand clap. I like to shout, but apparently I have the spirit of Tigger, you know, so my shout comes out, woohoo, you know. It's better than the Eeyore anointing. Okay, uh, you know, but anyway, thank you for having the patience to let me go four minutes and 59 seconds over. It's, it's blinking red now. I have to get out of here because, you know, we're about to have a meltdown. I think the reactor is going to go through to China. If you don't know that, Ray, you didn't see the movie, so forget it. But anyway, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. This is the first time I've preached uh, in about seven years, six, seven years. <laughs> There's... Uh, So there may, there may be some sort of renewal happening. If you can remember Mama Susan and me, 
we'd really appreciate it. We've had a number of obstacles and a number of trials, but God's been victorious through it all. So. Yeah. Aren't you, aren't you glad that we could pull him out of a pile of rubble? Yeah, hallelujah. hallelujah. I, love you. I love you too, sir. Come Thank on, give, you, give Michael a great big hand clap, would you? Hey, thanks for joining us here at the Living Word Online Campus. If you made the choice to follow Jesus today, congratulations. You just made the best decision of your life. But we don't want you to take this new journey alone. God designed us to be in community and to help each other. So we want to help you as you grow in your new faith. Just click the raise hand button in your chat box and we'll make sure and help you with your next steps. And if you're joining us on Facebook, you can text HOPE to the number that's on your screen. It's God's job to save you, but He's trusted us to help guide you in this brand new faith journey. Here at Living Word, we're all about taking next steps. Whether you're a brand new Christian or if you've been following Jesus for a long time, we believe we all have a next step to take. Now we're making it easier than ever for you to take next steps with the Church Center app. This app experience allows you to stay connected to everything happening at Living Word, and it makes it simple to take whatever your next step might be. You can register for Lifetrack, find a life group, sign up for baptism, request prayer, give financially, and so much more. We also want you to share your story. If God's doing something in your life that can encourage someone else, hop onto the app, click the Share Your Story button, and let us know. As scripture says, we believe we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. If you'd prefer to use a web browser, you can simply navigate to dlwc.info for the same experience. Whatever God did in your heart today, we pray that you carry it with you into the coming week and make a difference wherever you may be. We love you, we're for you, and we'll see you again next Sunday right here at Church Online.